Hey guys, Will here. So today we're going to be checking out Sigma Integrale's DK2 full motion system for your sim rig. So this is available in a couple of different configurations. We're going to be testing the four actuator version today. So this system is 100% made and assembled in the USA and it's generated quite a bit of hype simply because on paper it looks very similar, if not better than a lot of other motion systems on the market, which cost a lot more money than this does. So today we're going to be putting through its paces and seeing whether this is the motion system for your rigs. So let's check it out. Okay, so first things first, just to give you the full context of this review, this has actually been a long time in the making. We started chatting with Sigma Integrale back in February of 2021, in fact, and we received this system back in July last year. Now, when we received the system, it was only compatible with iRacing at the time, and we kind of did a little bit of testing. We decided that we'd hold off on doing a review until they developed their software further and the compatibility, just because we wanted to make sure that you guys watching the video had the, I guess, full picture with this system. Now, it is something that is continuing to evolve. They're adding new titles all the time. They're improving their software all the time. But we feel like the product is at a point now where it's mature enough that we can give you a clear understanding of what you can expect from this product if you were to buy one kind of long term as well. Now, obviously any review video is just a snapshot in time, but obviously people watch these videos and you know if they see that it's only compatible with iRacing, then they might write the product off entirely. So we have been testing this product for quite some time now, since July last year. So we don't have any sort of financial relationship with Sigma Integrale, and this is just a loan unit that we're checking out today. Day. So there are a couple of different configurations available with the DK2 system. They also do have a DK2 Plus system, which uses more powerful motors and gives you a little bit more aggressive feedback. We might be checking that out a little bit further on down the line. There's also a DK6 system available, which uses the same motors as in the DK2 Plus, but gives you six inches of travel rather than the two inches which is available on the DK2 and the DK2 Plus. Now the DK2, which we're looking at today, is also available in two different configurations, a four actuator system, which is what we're gonna be looking at today, as well as a three actuator system, which places one on the front and two on the rear. And the three actuator system basically sacrifices a little bit in terms of performance, but does save you quite a bit of coin. So while we're talking about money, the DK2 four actuator system comes in at 5,145 US dollars. Obviously you need to factor in shipping on top of that as well, depending on where you are in the world. The three actuator version, which we might do a separate video on later on down the track, comes in at 3,900 US dollars. So it is quite a significant saving there. And while we're certainly not saying that that isn't a lot of money. If we compare it to something like a D-Box G34250i, which is what I run on my daily driver rig, that has an inch and a half of travel as compared to the two inches of travel that we have with this system. And that comes in at around about nine and a half thousand US dollars, depending on where you buy it from. Now there are often some deals and cashbacks available on those D-Box systems. So it definitely pays to do your research there, but you're looking at a little bit more than half the price for a system like this as compared to the equivalent 4250i D-Box system. So it's gonna be really interesting to get stuck into this today and see exactly what you're getting for the money. So before we take a deeper dive into the hardware, another important mention here is not only do they make pretty much everything hardware wise in house themselves, but also develop the software entirely themselves too. And that includes their motion control algorithm, which they call Velocity Trap. Now, one of the things that they've made a really big point to us about throughout this entire review process is the fact that they're not using any canned effects whatsoever. Everything is designed and based off the raw telemetry coming out of the sim. And then they do all sorts of clever things with processing that raw data to create the effects that you feel through the seat of your pants in your rig. So you can imagine if you're running over a ripple strip or something like that, they might generate an effect for running over a ripple strip and then just play that effect whenever you hit a ripple strip for whatever duration you're on that ripple strip. Whereas here, instead of just telling the system, okay, driver is on a ripple strip, what it's doing is it's actually feeling the texture of the ripple strip, feeling the contact patch of the tire, the movement of the suspension, all those little details that are buried in the telemetry data in the sim and using that raw data to generate what you're feeling. And to give you an example, one of the reasons that we've been holding off on doing this review is we were waiting for their engine vibration algorithm to become available. That was just recently released as an update and that has made a massive difference to the overall experience in using this product. So again, telemetry based there and they've put a lot of effort into you know creating harmonics and really kind of creating that seat of the pants feeling that you get rather than just having a vibration that goes up and down with the RPM of the car. So we'll obviously explore 
explore that in a lot more detail when we get up and driving later on, but just wanted to mention that up front as it is an important part of the design philosophy through the software, manufacturing, hardware, and everything that you get here with the DK2 system. So let's take a deeper dive into the hardware now. So the system does comprise of quite a number of different components and cables and bits and pieces. We're gonna run through all of it now, but look, basically what it boils down to is you've got a control box which connects to your PC via ethernet, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, then we have four or three, depending on which system you go for, actuators, which are these guys. You bolt one of these to your rig in each corner. Now you do need to consider things like weight distribution and quarter balancing. We'll talk about that when we get up and driving a little later on too. But basically what you get in the box is four of these brackets or three, depending again on which system you buy. You bolt those to the actuators. The actuators then bolt to the sides of your rig. You then have a couple of connectors on the top of the actuator here. Those are shielded Molex connectors and they look like this. So there's two different sets of cables that you get in the box. You get a one meter length and a two meter length. So you will end up having this box quite close to your rig. You can imagine if you're running these cables all around from the four corners of your rig back to the box, you are relatively limited in how far away you can put this. So you're not gonna be putting it off in a corner of the room or something like that. But we've got one cable for power and one cable for data. As, as I mentioned before, those are shielded Molex connectors, nice and high quality there and they've got a decent amount of bend to them as well. So if you look at the D-Box system by comparison, that has a single very, very thick cable which runs to each of the actuators and that has a really shallow bend radius. So it can be quite difficult to kind of move the cable around and feed it around the rig to a convenient position. Whereas these are relatively easy to move around. So you've got two connections which plug in to the top of the actuator and then you guessed it, the other side of those cables then plugs in to the front of the control box. You've got one connector on the top, one connector on the bottom, and one position for each of the corners of the vehicle. So one, two, three, and four. And if you do go for the three actuator system, you do get the same control module, meaning that you can upgrade with an additional actuator later on if you want to. You just leave one of these slots free and the software will take care of the rest. So looking at the actuator in more detail here, the top portion here, or the motor assembly that is made by American Technic. That's called a clear path motor. And then everything from that point down, the actuator itself is all designed and manufactured in house by Sigma Integrale themselves. So the motor portion of the actuator and the power supply inside the control module, which we'll look at in a moment, both made by American Technic, and then everything else is made in house by Sigma Integrale. So a few more details on these actuators. You'll notice on the top here, we do have a bit of a heat sink assembly here to increase the surface area and dissipate a little bit of heat from the control circuitry which sits on the top here and one thing we did notice is that these do get quite warm in operation not hot by any means but definitely warm to the touch you're not going to burn yourself or anything like that though so that's not a concern you can see inside this little flap here there is a little usb micro connection i believe that's going to be for flashing firmware or programming the circuitry on the motor itself but it's not something that is necessary to connect to for the user and there's also a little status led in there as well to let you know what's going on with the motors and if we look at the rest of the actuator here, we'll spin it around to the front. You can see the mounting surface basically just bolts directly onto 40 series profile. So you bolt directly onto the sides of your rig. And then we've got non-captive rubber feet here too. So you can see a rubber pad on the bottom and then the actuator itself can actually float around inside that foot, which means the rig can move around a little bit and not bind up and cause problems in that regard. So there's a couple of different approaches to doing this kind of thing. It is important to note though that the D-Box system by default doesn't come with non-captive feet. It comes with little Teflon pads that you sit underneath. The uh, non-captive feet like what we have here as default are an additional option for the D-Box system. So it's good to see little details like that which are included by default rather than being an additional expense should you need it. So the actuator housing and foot are both CNC machined with this kind of tumble finish here. Gives it a nice kind of industrial look. I mean, obviously that's gonna be a subjective thing, but I actually think it looks quite classy and quite, uh, yeah, quite cool. And the logo there, CNC machined in as well. Now, one of the important factors with these actuators is the 50 millimeter piston here. Having a thick piston like this with tight tolerances between the bore or the outer layer and the piston or the inner layer means that you've got high tolerance for side load as well. So if you're needing to mount actuators in weird positions later on, or you've got a little bit of sideways load on it for some reason, you shouldn't have any increased issues with wear and tear. And this bolt goes into a little channel which is machined out on the flat edge of the piston here. And the way this actually travels up and down is the motor on top is spinning and it can actually spin at 2,500 RPM, which is pretty impressive. And then as that spins, it raises and lowers the piston. So you can imagine it's actually trying to rotate all the time and this kind of locks it in place. Now to ensure smooth operation as well, you can see in the side here, and it's a little bit hard to see, 
there's a Teflon sleeve which actually wraps around the entire piston. You can see where that's located just on those three holes there. So what that essentially means is that there's very, very little friction between the piston and the bore. And that is of course gonna minimize the noise of the piston sliding through the bore, as well as minimize wear and tear over time. So I think that's pretty much everything we need to cover in terms of the actuator. So let's have a quick look at the control box. Now we'll open it up as well, give you a look at the build quality internally too. But look, very simple in terms of its design inputs and outputs and everything. We already had a look at the interface here for connecting to our actuators. So we've got our power distribution along the top and our data distribution along the bottom. Now remembering as well that our control circuitry or motor drivers for the motors themselves connected to the actuators are actually housed in these assemblies on the top of each motor. So I don't actually expect that there's gonna be a whole lot going on inside this box when we open it up, but we'll see. So that is our interface along the front panel here. We also have our ethernet connection here for connecting back to our PC. Now they do include a nice shielded ethernet cable inside the box as well. You can see the shielding around the outside there. So that keeps the EMI to a minimum. Now, whether or not it would be better to connect via USB to the PC for, I guess, ease of use is a bit debatable here. Having the ethernet connection back to the PC does make things a little bit more complex as you'll see when we look in the software in terms of the initial setup. But once you've got that initial setup dialed in, it is very simple and everything works very well. Now, one of the issues with USB is that the longer the cable run, the more signal degradation you get to the point where at some point it's just gonna stop working. You need things like powered uh, extension cables to get a good quality connection. Whereas with an ethernet connection, the cable length is almost unlimited. Now, if you compare this to the D-Box, what they do is they have an ethernet connection from the master and slave boxes, which are, I guess, the equivalent to this, through to a little control module, which then connects to your PC. So you put the control module near your PC, connect to the PC via USB, and then run ethernet to the main control boxes for the rig itself. Now, in my mind, that is a slightly more convenient approach because it really does mean that it's purely plug and play. You literally just plug the box directly into the PC and install the drivers, you're good to go. Whereas with this one, you do need to set a static IP address for your ethernet connection. If you don't have a motherboard which has two ethernet ports on it, you will need to buy a USB to ethernet adapter too. They're not expensive. You can pick them up off Amazon for 15, 20 bucks. So it's not a big deal, but it is something to just consider there if your motherboard doesn't have two ethernet ports, which a lot of motherboards don't. But flipping it around now to the back, not a whole lot to see on the back here. We've got a two inch cooling fan. We'll have a look at that internally in just a minute. And then we've got our IEC power connection here and that is fused. As you can see, there's a little fuse cartridge there and then a master power switch. Now, interestingly, this is a switch mode power supply. So we've got 95 to 125 volt input and then 190 to 250 volts AC. So pretty much anywhere in the world that I can think of at least, uh, you shouldn't have any issues. You shouldn't need to run an inverter or any sort of power adapter to run this. So let's pop the cover off now and have a quick look at what we have inside. Okay, there we go. All right, yeah, I thought there might be a connection in here because there were some screws on the back side. So let's quickly unplug, take a mental note of what it was plugged into. So unplug these guys, there we go, one, two just standard molex connections and you can see our power supply module sitting on the top plate there which we'll set aside we'll have a look at that in just a second and then a couple of things going on in here so as i suspected there's not a whole lot going on you can see a little bit of dirt and debris that's got sucked in by that cooling fan that we were looking at before nice quality cooling fan there actually there's a couple of cues that just absolutely scream quality so first of all it's a ball bearing type fan and you can even see on the top edge here, they've actually used little rubber isolation feet to connect the fan to the housing. So you're not getting that vibration transfer by using fixed screws from the fan. So, I mean, just little things like that. Yeah, it makes a big difference. So let's have a quick run through what we have here in terms of circuitry. So we've got our power input here, a shielded fused IEC connection, and then that runs through to our power distribution circuit here. That obviously connects through to our main power supply, which we'll look at in just a second. We do have a little power transformer on this board as well, which is a Meanwell power transformer, an IRM 10-5, and that outputs five volts at two amps. So I assume that that is responsible for providing the power through to our control circuitry down here. So power distribution at the top, obviously the power supply too, and then we've got our control circuitry down the bottom here. So we can see a couple of USB connectors on here. USB micro, a USB micro and a USB A connection in the back there. 
obviously those aren't intended to be used by the user. We've got a micro SD card in the slot there, which is held in place with hot glue as well. So obviously not something that's intended to be removed. And basically we've got the brains on the top layer here and then control circuitry and distribution on the bottom layer. So you can see it's stacked quite nicely here. We've got little metal standoffs between with standoffs integrated into the housing itself. And then that basically runs across here. So not a whole lot of space being taken up by the control circuitry itself. All this space behind here is all completely empty. So there's plenty of airflow. And if we set that guy aside and here we have our Technic IPC or Intelligent Power Center 5. So this is the other piece of the puzzle which isn't made by Sigma Integrale themselves but is still USA made. So on the top surface here we've got that same kind of heat sink design that we saw on the motor control circuitry on each of the actuators. And again, very, very solid construction here. Nothing at all to be concerned about in terms of quality at all. Let's just quickly have a look at some notes on this guy. So this outputs 75 volts DC at 350 watt continuous or 500 watts fan cooled. Obviously we are fan cooled here or 900 watts peak. So a pretty hefty little power supply there. Obviously with the ability to move 500 pounds at 8.4 inches per second, it needs to be pretty hefty. But that is everything that we have inside the power supply. So let me get the clothes back on. So I'm sure you guys will agree, good build quality in terms of the control module. The only thing I guess I would nitpick here is the form factor. So it is quite a big, it is quite a big footprint, uh, 370 millimeters by 233 by 75. So it is quite big. And as we mentioned before, because we only have either one meter or two meter long cables included in the box, you are, by, by the time you cross those cables across your rig, given that you've got a actuator in each of the four corners, you're not gonna end up having this more than about a half a meter away from your rig at best. So I would like to see some sort of provision for mounting this enclosure. As you can see, it does have the little rubber feet on it, but there's no provision made for mounting this in any way. So it would be nice to be able to bolt it to the rig, maybe on the underside underneath the seat. I don't know whether maybe they've done this intentionally so that it's electrically isolated or maybe the vibration they might be concerned about. Uh, although I didn't see any cause for concern internally, nothing seemed to be you know, at risk of shaking loose other than maybe the little micro SD card, which was hot glued in place. But maybe even having the option for something like a 2RU rack mounted enclosure, something like that, just to make it a little bit more easy to mount. But otherwise, very impressed. So let's move on now into the software calibration and driving experience. So we have the actuators mounted up on our Track Racer TR120 cockpit now. A couple of quick things to note here in terms of spacing. There's a whole bunch of documentation and best practices on the Sigma Integrale website, so definitely check that out. That'll certainly help you figure out what's going to be best for your particular rig. A couple of quick points to note here though, in the software you can see there is a configuration tool here where you input the spacing between front to rear and left to right or right to left. And a couple of things to note with regards to the TR120 cockpit that we have this mounted on specifically, you can see it's a little narrower in the front than it is in the rear. So what we've done is we've actually added some extra profile on the front to make that spacing the same. So you can imagine if the rig was moving to the left, for example, and the actuators were slightly closer together on the front than what they are on the rear, you get a little bit of dip in the front as well. And obviously that's gonna throw the software and how it's actually trying to do things a little bit out of whack as well. So we don't have a uh, we don't have an adjustment here for offset. We just have the measurement from front to rear and uh, left to right. Now, best practice wise, and again, do check the website. What you generally wanna try and have is relatively even weight distribution from front to rear and as close to a perfect square as you possibly can as well. That's gonna mean that the range of movement available front to back is the same as from left to right. As we've got it configured here, we do have a little bit more movement from left to right in terms of how much it's gonna sway the cockpit simply because we have a slightly larger distance from front to back than what we have from left to right. But the software will compensate for that, but any sort of compensation that you have to do there is gonna restrict the movement in other areas. So you can imagine we've got a range of movement available in the actuators. If it's having to dial some of that movement out from some of the actuators to compensate for a non-perfect installation, then it is gonna restrict the movement ever so slightly. So just one thing to be aware of there. You can see here we've got a switch for three post or four post. So there is a three post which uses just a single actuator on the front. Now the other thing we noted earlier is that it is an ethernet connection back to your PC as well. So if you don't have two ethernet ports, would recommend you don't run your PC off Wi-Fi just to free up the network port for this. Generally speaking, the experience with online gaming is better with a wired connection rather than Wi-Fi just because of packet loss, jitter and things like that. But that's something for another video. So what we've done is we've actually connected the uh, Sigma into Grale box back to the PC with a 
USB to Ethernet dongle, and that all worked fine. All we needed to do here is just enter some static IP addresses, as you can see here. So we've gone into the properties here for our USB to network adapter, and we've just put in a static IP, but all the instructions are there in the manual, so we don't need to go into too much detail on that. Very simple to do, and we didn't have any problems at all with getting things up and running. So let's have a quick tour of the software now and take you through the basic configuration here. So I'm gonna start off by clicking on preferences. What you can do is put your IP address of your PC on the LAN into this field here, and that will allow you to connect through to this software via a web app, which we'll look at in just a moment as well. That allows you to make adjustments on your phone, for example, on the fly without having to alt tab out of your game, which is a really cool feature. Uh, something that I hope that we'll see on DBox before too long as well. We've got fields here for port for web UI and gRPC. Shouldn't need to worry about changing those and you can hit save there to make any changes that you make take effect. And then we've got available IP addresses here. You can see here, this is just the local IP and our ethernet IP or the IP address of our PC on our local area network. So you can see we've taken that IP and put it up in the top here. So simple there. So we'll click across to profiles now. And you'll remember at the start of the video, we mentioned how when this system was first sent to us was only compatible with iRacing. Happy to report that since then, we now have a wide variety of different games which this works with and they are adding new ones as well. So check their website and their Facebook page for the latest information there. But you can see here, we can select between AC, ACC, Automobilista 2, Dirt Rally 2, F1 2021, iRacing, Project Cars 2, Project Cars 3, R Factor 2, Race Room, Racing Experience, and X-Plane is in beta 2. So they are starting to move into flight sim stuff as well, which is very exciting. So we can choose any one of those games. We also have the ability to load and save profiles too. So say for example, you want to have multiple different custom profiles within a game for different cars, for example, you can do that. You can save them, you can send them to your friends to try out as well. So it's just basically you hit save as, it opens up a generic dialog box here and you can load and save in the same manner here. You can see down on the bottom left here, we have a couple of status boxes here. You can see that the software is running and web UI is running. If we click on the little QR code here, you can see it pops up with a QR code that we can scan to access this directly on our phone, as we mentioned before as well. And then on the right hand side here, this is all of our configuration and fine tuning adjustment for the motion itself. So pretty basic, not a whole lot of stuff to do here, but it does cover all of the essential stuff. So you can see we've got gas brake pitch, which is the pitch of the rig forward to back as we accelerate or as we brake. And we've got adjustments here for intensity, from zero all the way through to 10. And then we've got an adjustment here from zero to 10 for smoothing for each of these as well. So gas and brake, and if you hover over each of these, it does pop up with a nice little tool tip, which will let you know what it does. So let's just quickly run through each of these fields and we'll do a bit of a live tuning session and see what kind of changes I make from the default settings as we look at them now. So gas and brake, it says surge is very responsive and highlights the driver's pedal inputs. Surge also indicates pitch naturally and this layer replicates the responsiveness of surge by converting to responsive pitch movements. As you increase this, consider reducing the environment layer intensity. So often when we talk about surge, we're talking about forward to back movement in terms of an additional axis that the rig can actually slide forward and back on. What this is doing is essentially replicating the same kind of sensation in your body, but by tilting the rig forward and back. So in the absence of true surge, this works quite well. This is definitely something that you would dial down if you did have surge built into your rig though. So then turning roll or sway. Sway is very responsive and highlights the driver's steering input. Sway also induces roll naturally and this layer replicates the responsiveness of sway by converting to responsive roll movements. As you increase this, consider reducing the environment layer intensity. So what this is gonna do is make the rig pitch to the left as we turn to the right and vice versa, obviously replicating body roll of the vehicle. If we move down to heave, this is our up and down movement. So this layer captures the low frequency up and down movement up to 10 Hertz. Example, after a bump suspension setting occurs at approximately two Hertz. So this gives you the sensation of going over bumps, kind of rises and dips in the road, things like that. And that is something that obviously you can't get with a seat mover style rig, which only moves in pitch and roll. And for me, heave really kind of adds that sensation of really being inside a car, you know, feeling in your stomach when you go over bumps and things like that. So definitely one that we'll wanna spend some time fine tuning. Then we've got the environment adjustment here. So this layer captures the true pitch and roll of the game vehicle. So think of the game vehicle chassis as a two dimensional plane. This layer replicates in real time that plane's orientation in 3D space with scaling up to 100% of reality. So you can imagine rather than it replicating the movement of the suspension relative to the ground, what this is doing is it's replicating the actual movement of the vehicle. So if you're parked on an incline or parked on a slight curb or something like that, it's actually gonna tilt the entire rig to compensate for that relative movement between the environment and the vehicle itself. So that's what that is. So then we've got road vibration, pretty self 
self-explanatory, but it says this layer captures the high frequency up and down movement, 10 hertz to 60 hertz with independent signal for each corner. So that's obviously important. That means that we are able to replicate vibration from tire to road contact in each four corners of the rig, obviously dependent on the telemetry data coming out of the sim that you're playing. But most do allow for that telemetry now, so this should work quite well. For example, rumble strips inducing a 60 hertz vibration with a bias to the driver's side. This layer is optimal when the game telemetry is above 300 hertz, so it should work quite well in a set of Corsa Competizione, for example, which is the first game that we're gonna test out here and the one that I'm gonna take you through for all of our live tuning session. So then lastly, we have engine vibration with an adjustment here for intensity as well as distribution from front to rear. So obviously 80-20 means 80% in the front, 20% in the rear, and then you can slide that all the way through to whatever you want. So what it says here under the little tooltip, this layer captures the high frequency vibrations of the engine. Obviously, it will produce two high frequency vibrations for any given engine speed. So it kind of creates a harmonic kind of, uh, I guess, resonance here. And I know that they put a lot of effort into this to sort of really try and make it feel genuine rather than just matching the frequency in the actuators to the RPM, for example. So it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to experiencing. And that is basically it. So what we're gonna do now is hit power on. That should activate the actuators. You should see me rising up on the screen now. So I'm gonna hit that. And the rig will raise up. There we go. So it doesn't feel just with the movement like that, it doesn't feel quite as smooth as the D-Box 4250i does. Uh, that is, it almost feels like a hydraulic system kind of lifting you up, whereas you could really kind of feel the vibration slightly as that moved up and down. So it's gonna be interesting to see whether we get that same kind of robotic feel when we're driving in just a moment or not, but definitely a thing that I noticed different immediately there when we got up and running. But that is all up and running now. We've got a set of course of Competizione profile running. So let's head out on the track now for a bit of a live tuning session. Uh, I'll get my phone up and running here as well so we can make changes on the fly on our phone. And then we'll test it out in a range of different sim titles as well. Give a set of Corsa, iRacing, Dirt Rally 2, and maybe Automobilista 2 a bit of a try as well. And then we'll wrap it all up with our conclusions. Okay, so we're gonna start off with Mount Panorama Circuit in a set of Corsa Competizione. Lots of undulation here, lots of aggressive curbs. We've got some crests that should get us that pit of our stomach kind of feeling as we go along the straights as well. So lots of things here to digest. We've got the mobile phone app here. I shouldn't really call it an app because basically what it is is it's just a web page that you can access through your phone. But it all works really nicely. We'll bring this up on your screen as well. We can see our live tuning as we make adjustments here. So we're just gonna be starting off with the default settings as they come in the game's profile and then we'll fine tune from there. So let's head out onto track now. Whoa, okay, yep, we're active, <laughs> it's working. All right, let's start off by feeling the engine vibration a little bit before we head out. So really nice kind of resonance going through the rig now. Does feel quite genuine. If anything, maybe a little bit too over the top for this kind of car in real life, but we'll see how it feels when everything else is going on. We can definitely turn it down if we need to. I think, what did we have it? We had it set to 40% intensity at the moment. So we could turn it down quite a bit from there if we wish to do so, but we'll start off with default. But as I rev that up, it, it does have a really nice, authentic kind of feeling to it. So it doesn't just feel, this is kind of what I was describing before, what I was hoping for. It doesn't just feel like the, um, like the vibration is just purely replicating the frequency going up and down. There's definitely a lot more to it than that. And I can feel yeah, it really has a nice resonance to it. Let's rev it all the way up as well. Now, one thing that I've noticed with the D-Box system is that when you rev the engine up, you hear the actuators going vroom, vroom in proportion, whereas this, you hear a little bit, but it kind of tops out at around about 3000 and then it kind of just does other things from there. So it does feel different, but you don't hear it quite so audibly. So let's head out here already feeling slight rippling around. Now, when it comes to motion, less is often more to an extent. So we'll see what their default settings like. Oh, that gear change feels nice. Really kind of gives you that jerk as you, oh wow, the road textures feel really good as well. Going over the first crest here, pit of the stomach, <laughs> nice. So you'll hear my voice kind of jerking around a little bit like I'm on a roller coaster. And that is authentically how strong the rig is. So it is moving me around that much that it's making my voice shake. So I'm just gonna take it nice and easy while I kind of get a sense for everything that's going on here. 
come up over the top of the hill, but in its default configuration, it does actually feel very good. I probably would turn down the side to side movement at least just a little bit. You kind of want to have your motion set, at least in my opinion, and everybody's going to have their own take on this, but in my opinion, you kind of want to have your motion set so that you get a sensation of what the car's doing, but you don't want it to be throwing you around all over the place to the point where it makes it actually more difficult to drive. So it's one of the benefits that we have with simulation is that you can kind of tweak things and fine tune them to make you as fast as possible. Whereas in the real world, you kind of just have to deal with the hand that you're dealt in terms of movement and bouncing around. And I mean, Formula One porpoising is a perfect example of this. You see how much they're moving around in the cabin. Obviously, if they were able to dial that out and not have that movement, they would. So if you want to, if, you know, if your aim is to be as fast as possible, you can imagine if your rig is creating that porpoising, it's actually going to slow you down. So just an example there, but you can see just going down the straight here, how much movement there is, how much sensation. Whoa. <laughs> they really have done a very good job here. Now, a couple of other little observations that I have as well, just driving around up on the curb. Wow, the curb sensation feels really good as well. And I will elaborate on some of these sensations more than just saying feels good in just a moment once I've got my head around it. But it is a little more noisy than the D-Box system. You kind of get this rattling sound within the actuators themselves. I'm not sure exactly what that is. Must be something inherent in the design. But I noticed that when the actuators were winding up and winding down, we'll probably, we'll show you a clip of that in the conclusions, I think, just to give you a real sensation of how loud it is. It's not gonna be the loudest thing on your rig for most people, I would say. But if you don't use headphones, you will definitely hear it. So. No, actually, I take that back. On this rig, it is the loudest thing that I can hear. But <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it obviously, it's going to depend on the rig that you have. We are running the Husingville Ultimate Plus pedals here, which are very, very quiet pedals. But you do kind of get that rattling sound through the actuators. And we have gone over the entire rig to check that nothing's worked its way loose or anything like that as well. So that is all fine. But yeah, look, in terms of the default settings, it does feel very, very good. I think there's a couple of things that I want to try and smooth out a little bit. Remember, we do have those smoothing settings set to zero. So let's just get down onto Conrod straight again, and I'll make a couple of tweaks. But yeah, very genuine. If you've never driven a full motion cockpit before, it really does give you a lot of additional sensation over what you get with something like a seat mover. Just that ability to have heave, so that movement, the bouncing up and down over bumps, really adds a lot to the immersion. Now, I don't think the motion system is going to make you faster overall in most cases, but definitely when it comes to immersion, it adds a lot. So let me wake up my phone now quickly. So you can see here basically all the settings that we had before replicated on the screen without any of the other clutter, which isn't important in the context of what we're doing. So what I'm going to do to begin with is add a little bit of smoothing Actually, we'll add a lot of smoothing to begin with and then we can wind it down because I don't have any idea kind of how much difference this is going to make as a starting point. So I'm going to decrease my turning roll a little bit as well. I felt that was a little bit too much and I'm going to wind that up to five as well. Just see how smooth this makes everything feel. Heave, I was pretty happy with, but I might wind that down one click for now and again, set my smoothing to five. Environment, so the, re the relationship between the vehicle itself and the, uh, and the 3D environment. We're gonna leave that on five, increase our smoothing. Road vibrations I was happy with. Engine vibrations I felt could maybe be a little bit less. So I'm gonna set that to 30 and I'm gonna set the distribution here to 50-50 as well. See what kind of difference that makes. Now it doesn't look like we've got a save button. So all of those changes should just take place immediately. I'll set the phone back down and let's see what it feels like now. So definitely straight away I can feel that engine vibration is a little bit less than what it was before. In fact, I think that's probably a little bit too low. So I'm gonna bump that back up to 40 again. I am feeling it more in the seat of my pants now that it's not distributed to the front. So I'm actually gonna wind that all the way up and see how intense it is. Yeah, okay, so it's not a, it's not hugely more intense winding it up to 100%. It's not like rattling me all over the place. I'm gonna crank that down to 70-ish. Yeah, we'll go 70 for now. There we go. Yeah, with 50-50 with distribution, I think 70 feels pretty good. 
I definitely get that sensation in the seat of my pants. It probably is a little bit more exaggerated than what it would be in real life, but it feels nice and uh, yeah, I think it's good. So let's leave that there and let's go for a bit of a drive again. What I'm interested to see here is whether the engine vibration sort of dulls out some of the other effects. So when it comes to audio systems, which this works kind of in a sense similar to, when you're sending a lot of low frequency signals through a speaker and then trying to use that same cone to replicate high frequency sounds, what happens is the high frequency sounds end up getting sort of muddied out by the uh, displacement of the lower frequencies and the amount of, you know, the amount of volume, the amount of movement in the cone that's necessary to create higher sound pressure levels at lower frequencies. So I'm interested to see whether having that constant vibration with the engine dulls things out. Now everything does feel a little bit more dull now than it did before and that's purely just because of the amount of smoothing that I'm running I think. It feels probably a little bit too fluid now I would say. But let's go down the straight again and just feel how it feels over those bumps. So yeah, the, the bumps just don't quite have the intensity. It feels more like I'm on a, on a ride rather than in a racing car now, I think. Still kind of get the pit of the stomach feeling there. Curbs still feel pretty good. Yeah, that felt good. So I'd say if I were focused more on competitiveness and less on immersion, I'd probably want the setting something more like this. It's not rattling me around in my seat so much, it's not really throwing me around, so it's not sort of breaking my gaze, so to speak, but it definitely doesn't feel quite as authentic as it did with the default settings. Remembering again that that intensity level was only at about sort of 50% of what's possible with this rig. Whoa, missed the brakes. <laughs> All right, let's stop again here quickly and do a couple more adjustments as I get thrown around over the bumps there. So I'm going to I'm going to turn down the smoothing on my uh, turning roll, turn down the smoothing on my heave to three. Environment, I'm going to set to four, I think, and maybe I'm going to crank up the intensity one notch on the environment too. Road vibrations, I might actually try increasing that just one notch as well, see how that feels. And I'm gonna, I am gonna wind my engine vibration down just a touch because I did feel like it was a little bit overpowering compared to some of the other effects. And then gas brake pitch, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn that smoothing down to two as well. Just see if it makes it feel a little bit more, I guess, energetic rather than so, uh, so dulled out and smooth. So let's get underway again. I really love the ability to just make those fine tuning adjustments on the fly without having to alt tab out. Yeah, okay, that feels a lot more authentic now. Let's go. And what I would say is like, I was concerned when, um, when we first powered up the rig and I kind of, I felt the texture in the rise and fall compared to the D box. I was a little bit concerned that the movement might feel quite robotic with this system, but it doesn't seem to be the case, at least in terms of the sensation that I'm feeling. I mean, you guys can see for yourselves in the footage of the movement, whether it looks like it's kind of jerking around at all, but it feels very fluid and smooth to me. It doesn't, doesn't feel robotic really at all, which is quite, quite, an, quite an impressive achievement, I would say, when you consider all the things that are going on here. And the other thing that I'm not noticing, which is, an amazing thing is latency of any sort whatsoever. Now they go they go into quite a bit of detail on latency on their website. There's an entire page which is dedicated to the uh, response time of each individual component in the system. So the software, the individual actuators, the processing that happens on board the actuators themselves, the box that processes everything through the network adapters, everything. So they've obviously spent a lot of time really trying to optimize things there and that really shows. Now I haven't noticed latency being an issue on the D-Box system at all either. So it's certainly not, I wouldn't say it's a point of advantage over that system being the only other system that I've ever tested. But definitely no issues whatsoever when it comes to latency or lag or anything like that. Everything feels very much real time to me, at least as far as my senses are concerned. 
Other people may be able to determine a little bit of lag there. But obviously there is a little bit of lag there because the numbers tell you so, but not enough that I'm feeling it. And I know that is one of the things that people have complained about with the uh, SFX 1000 or SFX 100 system, the uh, DIY kits. Not only just in a bit of la input lag, but also just in the response time of the actuators themselves and how quickly they respond to fast movement. Obviously, you know, be able to be able to replicate sharp bumps in the road, the actuators need to be able to go up and down very, very quickly. And I believe that the uh, the motors in these actuators are running at over 2,000 RPM, which goes to show you know just how quickly they have to be able to move. But this feels absolutely incredible now. I'm really happy with the way this feels. One thing I would like to see in the software is an overall intensity adjustment. So once you have everything dialed in relative to each other, having one slider that allows you to scale up or scale down the overall intensity of all the effects, that's one thing that I do find I use quite often in, um, in the D-Box software, just to allow me to wind things down for particular cars. Obviously some cars are gonna have more movement in the suspension than others, and that does make a difference. So I would like to see them add that just so you don't have to go through and kind of wind down every single slider to get to the level that you want when you're changing between different cars. But obviously you can save different profiles if you wish to do so. But what I'm gonna do now is spend a bit of time driving here, do a little bit more fine tuning, let you know kind of where I land, and then we're gonna try out some other sims as well, see how the experience translates across in those, and then wrap everything up with our conclusions. So I spent a little bit more time fine-tuning in Assetto Corsa Competiciano just to get the most out of the system for what I like. And look, motion is a very subjective thing. Some people are gonna prefer certain effects over others. What I sort of try to aim for in my experience over the last nine months using a D-Box system is to try and sort of, I guess, get things that it will enhance the driving experience, things that give me cues as to what's going on with the car and make me feel a little bit more in control and a little bit more connected to the car than I do with just a steering wheel and pedals being that the steering wheel is usually the only thing that you can actually feel any sensation of what's going on with the car and the rest of it is all just down to visual cues. What I find is if you crank the motion up too much or you just have too many things going on, it can overwhelm your senses and it actually ends up detracting away from consistency and lap times rather than necessarily enhancing the experience. So it's a fine balance between whether you wanna to aim to go fast and consistent or whether you want to have the maximum amount of immersion. So for me, it's very much a case of less is more and I rely more on the kind of haptic feedback than the physical movement itself. So having spent a lot of time experimenting, that is where I've landed. It'd be really great to hear from you guys in the comments who have motion systems, whether you take a similar approach or whether you do something different. But in a set of course of competition, the thing that really jumped out to me was how good the curbs feel in particular. Really got a strong sensation of the car kind of coming up on the curbs. The texture of the ripple strips themselves and even things like bumping over sausage curbs really gave a good sensation of what you're feeling in the vehicle. And an important thing to point out, I think, is that with a motion system, the aim should always be, again, in my opinion, to replicate what you're feeling in the seat of a car rather than actually replicating the movement of the car itself. So you're not trying to replicate the body roll and everything that goes on with the body relative to the uh, relative to the environment. It's more just about trying to get that sensation of the seat of the pants feeling. And what I found is that I was deeply immersed in the experience and yeah, it gave me everything that I needed to feel to sort of know what was going on with the car. And while it didn't necessarily make me any faster than I was before, definitely added to that immersion and made the whole experience a lot more enjoyable. Things like going over crests and bumps and the sensation that you get in the pit of your stomach when you go through a rouge, for example, very well replicated in the sim. And it really did give a good sense of, I guess, a three-dimensional environment that you're traveling through uh, inside the game rather than just sort of being connected to a wheel and only feeling what the car's doing. So it definitely adds a lot to the experience in ACC. And next I moved on to iRacing and I was very happy to find that the experience was quite consistent with what we'd had with ACC previously. So there was nothing that was obviously lacking. The definition in the 
curbs and running up on the ripple strips was maybe a little bit less defined. We did have to fine tune and tweak the settings a little bit just to kind of amplify those things. But I think that's just down to differences in the telemetry data rather than anything that's lacking in the Sigma Integrale software. I was excited to jump into Dirt Rally 2 and see what Dirt textures felt like there. And while it wasn't as defined as I perhaps hoped for, I think that's just down to, again, the telemetry data that's actually coming out of Dirt Rally itself. It felt very similar to what we have on the D-Box and it's just, it, it just doesn't have that really sort of granular texture that you get in some of the more hardcore sim titles like ACC and iRacing. But still gave a good overall experience, definitely gave you a strong sensation when you went off the main track and onto the sides, going through grass and stones and things like that all felt good. And again, the body roll and sensations that you actually get through the body of the car into the seat of the pants is definitely enough to immerse you in the three-dimensional world and really sort of add to that overall driving experience. I tested out Assetto Corsa as well as Automobilista 2, and both of them were pretty consistent with the overall experience as well. A couple of standout things. I really loved the sensation driving the V8 supercar in Automobilista 2, particularly around Mount Panorama when you go over those bumps as I was describing in the live tuning session in ACC. With the softer suspension that you have in the V8 supercar compared to things like GT3 cars, you really get a sensation of the car kind of rising up over the crest of the hill and then bouncing down. You could really kind of feel the rear suspension moving around and just the body roll sensation as well was very, very authentic. Really gave a good sensation of what kind of movement was going on in the car itself. I said, of course, it was a lot of fun in the Porsche 962 as well. We've got a couple of decent power slides going around Spa. And while you don't get the same sensation of traction loss like what you get with a dedicated traction loss system with Sway or Yaw, what you do get is still a good sensation of the body roll and the car kind of kicking to the side in each direction as you kind of counter steer and move around. And again, it does definitely add to the driving experience, although it won't necessarily make you any faster than you were without motion. And that was the driving experience overall, very consistent across all the different titles. I was very happy to see that the software did detect when you change sims as well. So while there was a little bit of configuration that was needed for some of the titles, did have to go into an XML file, make some changes for Dirt Rally 2, for example. For the most part, it was pretty much a plug and play experience. And we didn't run into any problems at all that weren't covered easily with documentation already in place on the Sigma Integrale website. Now, motion compensation is of course a factor when it comes to using screens, whether it's a single screen or triple screens as well. Now, our preference, having tried out a bunch of different screen sizes and motion systems, is that VR or screens that are actually fixed to your rig, so moving in unison with the rig, do tend to work best. But ultimately, it's gonna boil down to how much your perspective sitting inside the rig is moving relative to those screens. Now, there are some motion systems that are starting to hit the market now, which do have inbuilt motion compensation to allow the screen perspective to actually move in unison with the cockpit, even though the screens are fixed to the ground. It's gonna be really interesting to test those systems out. In my experience and Tom's experience, we haven't found that to be overly necessary at the motion levels that we run. Ultimately, if your perspective relative to the dashboard inside the car is bouncing all over the place, it is gonna make it harder to drive. And that of course goes for any motion system, not just the DK2. So as the first motion system that you spent any significant time with, how do you feel about the DK2? Oh, it's been so much fun having it on the system. It's it's a very, very enjoyable experience having it on. And right, yeah. I guess my, my first concern before installing it was that it might be really hard to install and yeah. hard to fine tune and get it going well, but it just wasn't the experience at all. It was yeah. it was so easy, as easy as you know any other sort of you know general peripheral installation yeah, kind of thing. I think it's, it's not... one of those things that kind of it, it it seems really complex. It seems like it might be hard to sort of get the software set up, and mm. you know there there isn't a whole lot of fine tuning sliders and things that are available with this, which is kind of good. Yeah, it does make it a little bit more accessible, yeah. I think. Yeah. But what I found, and I mean, let let us know what your experience was like, but. It, it didn't really take me a whole lot of time to sort of fine tune and sort of, I guess, come to grips with what I was doing and... No, uh, and I know. definitely didn't feel like I was missing out on any, you know, changeable parameters or anything like that. I, yeah. I didn't feel like I needed to change more than I could. Yeah. Uh, so what they have there in the software is what you need and yeah. it's easy to use and it's it works well, it's good. Yeah, and the mobile... Thing. Yeah, I keep yeah. on calling it an app. It's not an app. It's a page that's accessible within your local area network. Yep. So you put in your IP address on whatever yep. device you want and it just Yeah, pops up. and I had my phone on a mount on the cockpit itself yep. so I could literally while I was driving just reach over and yeah, make changes just slide things around, really so. really good. Yeah, little little details like that definitely make a big difference and I feel like mm. they've really, you know, taken their time to really dial yeah. that stuff I in. did I did have one major problem though. Yeah. My sim is on the top level of of my house yep. and my son's bedroom is right underneath it. Yeah. And this thing on the top story made the house rattle something <laughs> savage. <laughs> yeah, look, we're, 
all the places that I've run a motion system myself have all been on a slab on the bottom floor, so I haven't had that experience. Yeah, it is fine. And running it here in the studio, it's it's not particularly noisy. Yeah, look, I, I don't know if I agree with that. It, it's definitely a lot more noisy than the D-Box system is by comparison. It's got that kind yeah, of okay. rattle in the actuators that you can hear even with headphones on. Yep. Uh, if you have the volume cranked up to you know the normal kinds of levels that I play at, it wasn't a problem, but it's definitely more noisy than the D-Box system yeah. is. The D-Box system, obviously, when you're doing things like engine vibration, you do get that vibration transferred through to the floor. And you know, if you're not on a solid floor, it is gonna vibrate. Mm. And even with the D-Box system, if I'm playing that in one room and you know my wife's in another room, she's gonna hear it and she's yeah, gonna be like, yeah. what's that noise? Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely something that you need to consider if you're you know, playing with other people in the house or whatever, even if you turn the motion levels down. If you are using that kind of high frequency tactile vibration type of feedback, you're definitely gonna get that resonating through the house. Yeah, and look, it just wasn't plausible to run this system on the top story with kids sleeping yeah, but anywhere think, in the house. Yeah, I think really, you'd find but, um, that it would be the same with any actuator based yeah, motion absolutely, system. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So it's certainly not a complaint about this system yep. specifically, but, Definitely. but it is important to note that this is more noisy than the D-Box 4250i system, which is what I run on my system every day. And I don't know whether that's something that's just, it seems to be inherent to the design of the actuators themselves. You can hear this kind of rattling and clicking noise in the top of the actuators as they spin. And um, yeah, it was the same across all four actuators. So it doesn't appear to be an issue with any particular one. And um, yeah, it did seem to be pretty consistent there. And what we could do is we could actually show you an example of that right now. So I guess the big question that a lot of people are gonna have is how does a system like this compare to some of the other options that are available on the market? We can only talk about ones that we've personally tested. So I'm gonna compare it directly to the D-Box 4250i. Now, straight off the bat here, I've got a little bit of pricing in front of me. In US dollars, given that the DK2 system is a USA made product, uh, the four actuator version as what we tested today, uh, comes in at 5,145 US dollars. There is the option for a three actuator based system as well, which puts one at the front and two at the rear. That comes in quite a bit cheaper at 3,900 US dollars. We haven't tested that configuration yet, so I'm not gonna comment on that in today's video. But if you compare that to the D-Box 4250i system that I have on my daily driver rig, that system, if you buy it from SimLab where we got our one from, comes in at equivalent 9,540 US dollars. Now there are deals available there. I know Sim Lab were offering, I don't know if they're still offering a cash back on the P1X system. So if you buy it with the P1X, you get the P1X for free, or if you've already bought a P1X system, they give you a cash back for that rig. So mm. it is gonna end up being a little bit cheaper than that in most cases, but the price as it's stated on their website equates to 9,540 US dollars compared with $5,145 for the DK2 system. So that is not an insignificant that's amount of money. Big amount of money. To put it in perspective, that's enough money to buy a- a car? Yeah. <laughs> You could buy a car. In sim racing terms, it's enough money to buy a very high-end wheelbase, a nice wheel, and a decent set of pedals as yeah, well. So yeah, it's definitely. it's definitely a huge difference. And mm. I honestly, other than the noise levels, I was honestly surprised at how close this came to the D-Box system yeah, well. in terms of the experience. Mm -hmm. I did definitely notice when we were going through calibration cycles and starting and stopping the system, that when the when the D-Box system goes up and down in a linear fashion, it's definitely a lot smoother. I think I mentioned in the review that it feels almost hydraulic when it goes up and down, whereas this feels a lot more kind of mechanical. Mm. But, but when you're actually driving, mm. it didn't feel it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I find the D-Box feels very clinical yeah. Uh, whereas this sounds very, me feels very mechanical and yeah. it's almost got an authenticity about it that yeah. I don't quite get from the D-Box. Granted, the D-Box settings that I've used yeah. are all your settings, how you like it, not yeah. how I've personally tuned it. Yeah, I have the D-Box wound down quite a bit for, you know, our point of view videos and stuff. So yeah. obviously it does have a lot more movement but I think Thinking back to when we were first seeing it up and experimenting with it, yeah. I, I find that maybe it didn't quite have some of the sharpness in, in the response that this has. I think that a lot of the a lot of the, a lot of the effects that you're getting through like ripple strips and things like that in the D-Box system are more like effect based rather than yeah, telemetry okay. based. Yep. And obviously Sigma Integral I've spent a lot of time really dialing in and getting those settings. 
things mm. right. And I mean, even just through the discussions that we've had with them in the last 10 months or so since we've had this system, mm. you know, we've had a lot of discussions with them around the development of the effects and what they're doing there. Mm. And, you know, hey, guys, this is coming soon. This is coming soon. Like, mm. you know, so obviously they're spending a lot of time getting it right. and They're not releasing stuff until they're really satisfied with yep. it. Yep. And it's also important to note as well that this is a system that has been developed specifically for sim racing, mm. whereas D-Box isn't focused primarily on sim racing. They make all sorts of systems of cinema and yeah, you know, right. stuff like that. Yep. So, yep. you know, no, it, they're a very passionate group of people. Definitely. From the conversations we've been having, they just love what they're doing, which is so definitely. cool to see. So another thing that I was really interested to see is the build quality of this compared to the far more expensive D-Box system as well. And, you know, while there are a couple of obvious things that, you know, aren't quite built to the same level as with the D-Box system, you've got the big thick cables that are integrated with all that shielding mm. on the D-Box, for example. But I felt like this certainly wasn't poor quality by comparison. I felt like everything you needed was kind of there. Mm. We didn't have any problems with interference or anything like that. No. Um, you know, the quality of the connections is all fine. And yeah, there was no issues whatsoever. Everything's nice and sturdy and solid and... Yeah, no, yeah. I've had no issues with any overheating or anything working loose over time. You did um, step on the heat sink at one. Oh, one, one of these, <laughs> the, right into my foot. Yeah. That was horrible. Don't, don't step on the top of the actuators. It's not a good time. Wear shoes, kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely no issues at all with the build quality as far as I'm concerned. From the internals on the box to the cabling, the actuators themselves, power supplies, all that stuff, no issues. The software quality is fine as well. There's no issues there. It, does, it just... There doesn't appear to be any corners cut anywhere with this. Mm. And I mean, it is an expensive system. 5,000 US dollars is a lot of money. So mm. you wouldn't expect any <laughs> cheap quality. But when yeah. you compare it to the D-Box system, yeah. you know, it, it stacks up, which mm. which I wasn't sure would be the case. So, yeah. yeah. So overall, I, um, I really can't see any reason not to recommend this system. I think it's a really great system. Obviously, they're very committed to the future of it as well, uh, releasing software updates regularly, improving things regularly. And like you said before, they're a really passionate team of people that uh, are obviously committed to the future of their brand and yeah, yeah they have a discord server where they're they're quite active in there if yep. anyone has questions and things like that they can jump on there and ask them directly they've been really yep. good so yeah awesome awesome so yeah that is basically all we can say at this point i'm very happy with it i think that you know obviously it's a lot of money to spend on your rig it's not going to make you faster or more consistent i but don't it's think so much fun it really is <laughs> so much fun <laughs> it adds a lot to the immersion and um yeah i mean some people will say that it made them faster some people will say motion doesn't make them faster some people will say that motion takes away from the experience overall because it's not authentic and you know, yeah. there's all sorts of different schools of thought on this but at the end of the day it's a ton of fun and I think that's the main reason why most people are looking at a system like this. They want to have fun, they want to add that next level of immersion to their system and this absolutely achieves that in my opinion. Yeah, agreed, 100%. 100%. So that's it guys, <laughs> I really hope that... <laughs> That's it guys, I really hope that the review has helped you guys out. If it has, leave a thumbs up, make sure you sub to the channel as well so you don't miss future videos and we will see you again soon. Bye. See ya.